the one thing that I like, um, going through various science fiction shows, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is they always make, of course, they always make planets inhospitable, yeah. but hospitable enough yeah. Yeah. That we can be there, and I just I yeah, they're not landing on gas giants usually. I mean, well, you get into one exception being the, the species 10 C one, but yeah, they're they're usually pretty close to Earth, even if they're not Earth like conditions. Well, now going back into Star Trek Discovery, yeah, um, I really like the way they took in the first season mm -hmm. a microorganism like a tardigrade mm -hmm. and used it mm -hmm. in such a way mm -hmm. that expanded on it on what they actually do totally totally no i agree i agree i mean and there are aspects of it which are great there are aspects of it which are sometimes problematic so like with the tardigrade i'll use that as an example first then we'll come back to some others with the tardigrade i mean this is you know a, a microscopic organism as you said um the one tr challenging thing this is a common mistake with sci-fi and you know, this comes up with like ant-man and things like that too you can't take something that's tiny and just make it gigantic and it works, right? So one of the reasons the ants look really strong is, is because, you know, by virtue of being small, they can actually carry seemingly a lot more than if they were big. There's something called the square cube law that essentially is, as, as you grow something, the square, you know, like square, if you, you know, if you were to use actual square, like a factor of two, uh, so, sur uh, so area of a square versus, say, volume of a cube. As you grow, the volume is growing a lot faster than, the, than that, the area of the square. Muscle, like muscle cross section, would be going by the square, but weight and things like that would be going by the cube. So if you make something really small, it can actually be really, really strong. But if you make that same thing uh, really big, it'll actually collapse under its own weight. So this is one of the issues with something like the tardigrade. The other thing with tardigrade too is that uh, there's a there's a story out there that tardigrades can survive uh, in space. That's not untrue, but it's exaggerated a little bit. Like there are a couple, I looked up the original studies on this and. There, there was a study where the, they were taken up by the European Space Agency and put in the International Space Station, exposed to space. And for one of the species, all of them died. For the other species, just almost all of them died. <laughs> but a couple lived. So, I mean, yeah, better but than people. Possible, would. not probable. <laughs> exactly. Well said. I like that. So, it's certainly better than people. If they had taken up a thousand people, all of them would have died. But, you know, with the tardigrade, there were a handful that made it. So it's a little overstated, but still, you know, it's still cool. And what I like, as you said, is they're, they're trying to use the real science, the real biology to incorporate into the show. Similar to that from the first season also, if you think about the spore drive, this was clearly inspired by a TED talk by the real world Paul Stamets, who is a mycologist who studies actually fungi. And he has this talk called, you know, something like Seven Ways Mushrooms Can Save the World. And in there, he makes these quotes about extraterrestrial fungi. Clearly, this inspired Brian Fuller. You can actually go back over Brian Fuller's tweets or X's as you call them now, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> but if you go over his tweets, he actually has, has uh, cited that talk several times prior to when Star Trek Discovery came out. So yeah, they're trying to incorporate a lot of the current science in there. It's always very, very admirable when they do that. Sometimes it fails. So with the tardigrade, there's a quote that Michael Burnham says in her uh, in the first season where she said, like its microscopic cousins on Earth, the tardigrade incorporates a lot, uh, foreign DNA into its genome by horizontal gene transfer. That was very technical. I remember that caught my eye when they said that. Two years before Discovery came out, there was a paper published in a very reputable journal which said that the, the tardigrade had a high rates of horizontal gene transfer. So that worked right into the episode. Problem was is that the next year, which is still before Discovery came out, that was shown to be wrong. <laughs> there probably weren't as many press releases about it. But still, kudos to the writers for trying to incorporate cutting edge scientific results into their show right off the bat. Like, this is hot off the presses. We're gonna work it in. Like, oops. <laughs> Good effort though. Oh. A plus for effort. So what? what uh, you, know, you said your parents were engineers. Like, yeah. How'd you get into like biology? You just like, why aren't you an engineer? You get that? <laughs> I, mean, I think I would have been happier if I'd been an engineer. But I, I, that that aspect never appealed to me as much. I always I always loved animals. I loved playing with things. Yeah. The soft tech, not the hard tech. There you go. There you go. Exactly. That's my wife. Doctor Emma McDonald always says she hates the squishy. Whereas I love the squishy. <laughs> <laughs> She's on the physics side. Physics side. Uh, so what's kind of new in your in your world? What is there? You just spoke about cutting edge science. What's yeah. the new thing you're excited about? In terms of my personal research, or just in the, in the world? In your research, in your field, yeah. like what's a? So my research right now, the research project we're we're doing is we're trying to understand why there are so many lethal causing gene variants in natural populations. 
So if we were to actually get full DNA sequences for all of us here, there's a decent chance that every one of us has a lethal causing genetic variant that would make it so we wouldn't live to adulthood. Now, obviously, we're all adults, so obviously it didn't kill us. But what, what, those, what those variants tend to be, they tend to be recessive, meaning you have to have two copies. You have to inherit the same one from your mom and from your dad. We pro well, you probably only got it from one of our parents. But this begs the question, why are these so common? Why are there so many of these lethal causing genetic variants out there? This is one of the reasons, by the way, inbreeding is bad. That if you have kids with your sibling, you probably pass on that same lethal causing variant, and then boom, the kid's dead. Right? So <laughs> I always say this is probably what makes the Targaryen line so bad. <laughs> Game of Thrones. But we're trying to understand this. We, we collected a whole bunch of wild fruit flies from my backyard. They also have these lethal causing genetic variants. We have two big uh, steps to the project. One is to basically just identify what are the different variants. Because it's not the same one. Everybody has a different one, right? So we're trying to identify what are the genes that are doing this. And the other part, <coughs> which we haven't actually started yet, is to try to figure out uh, what are the evolutionary forces that are, that are causing them to persist for so long. Is it just the mutation rate is that high? Or is it that maybe when you have one copy, sometimes you're better off? Which sometimes happens. So sickle cell anemia is a case of that. In humans, if you have one copy of the variant, you're actually potentially better off because you're actually resistant to malaria. So if you live in, in areas where there is malaria, you'll see that there's higher rates of sickle cell anemia because that, that having one variant is actually good. Well, it's kind of you know, the balance that, that makes us, you know, the, the odds of us surviving. Exactly, exactly. So that, that's, in terms of my actual research, that, that's definitely got me going. I love it. <laughs> I have a great team of students working on it. Um, where do you see the science of biology going in the next 10 years? Yeah, so in the last 20 years, we've had, <coughs> and I'm very biased in terms of this, I mean, my focus will be not just of all biology, but the areas that I'm most familiar with. In the last 20 years, we've had massive, massive improvements in being able to get DNA sequences from whatever we want, easily, rapidly, things like that. If you think of the original human genome, first human genome project finished in 2001 with the draft genome, and that cost, like, I forget, hundreds of millions of dollars, it took whole, you know, giant teams of people internationally. Now you can get an undergrad to do this over the summer. It's not a big deal. <laughs> the technology is so much better. That said, our understanding of what all that means. You, know, you, get all these, you, know, you get all these little letters on a piece of paper. Okay. <laughs> people assume that once we have it, like, oh, now we know. Like, yeah, but that's, that, like, we have the letters, but it's, it's in some code that nobody understands, right? So understanding how that translates to the various traits, to diseases, to you know, how long you're going to live, to you know, muscle mass, or whatever, you know, whatever trait you're interested in, that is going to dominate for the next several years. And it has been. I mean, the, since, the, since those genome sequences have come out, people have been focusing on that. We have a long way to go, though. Long, long way to go. So we're not expecting yeah, that <laughs> whatever uh, corner store genetic manipulation to occur anytime soon. No. <laughs> well, I mean, to some extent, we can do some genetic manipulation if, for example, it's a known disease-causing variant. Let's say, like, you might, you might be familiar with BRCA1 or BRCA2, these are common breast cancer associated variants. There, you can see what it is, and potentially, like, we have the technological ability, there's always ethical questions, we have the technological ability to go in an embryo and edit it and fix it. But we're nowhere near, now I, I don't advocate this, but we're nowhere, nowhere near being able to create con, for example. Yeah. You know, people say, like, oh, let's make somebody super intelligent and super smart. Like, yeah, no, we have no idea where to start. <laughs> uh, well, as we kind of wrap up here, same question we ask everybody. What advice do you have for young people wanting to get into you know, your line of work uh, or just science in general? Oh, yeah, ask questions. That's the first part. Ask questions. You know, n don't be shy. People love, like, if you go to a scientist and you find them, and people often say, like, oh, oh, I don't want to bug them. Like, oh, my God, you can't flatter a scientist more than say, tell me about your work. <laughs> Please go ask them. If you, want, if you want to get some research experience, let's say you're going to college or something like that, you want to get some research experience, look up just on a website, whatever professor, like, oh, here's this chemist who's doing this really cool stuff with soft matter, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Just shoot that person an email and say, hey, I love your work. And maybe she'll reply and say, like, yes, I would love to have you come, you know, join my research team or something like that. So... Show initiative, show interest, and you know, obviously do your homework. <laughs> um, last question for well, you. Let me stress one thing I said earlier. I just want to be very, very clear. I don't advocate making con. <laughs> 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 be very clear about that point. I don't want that to come up later. <laughs> All right, last question from me for Geeky Cool. Sure. One thing I've noticed through all the interviews I've done with the scientists mm -hmm. is just their overwhelming excitement. Yeah. Um, but we don't get into it for the money. <laughs> Why do you think scientists always have that, if you want to call it, youthful exuberance 
when talking about what they're doing no matter the field. Yeah. Well, actually, the joke thing I said maybe part of it, honestly, that, again, we don't get into it for the money. So, I mean, if you're going to science, it's, it's, a, it's a tough haul. You have to be really excited about it. I, I don't think it's exclusive to science. I think the same thing would, would apply, for example, to acting. I mean, again, you don't get into it for the money. You have to be really passionate about it, really excited about doing it. So I think that's true for a lot of fields, but I think with that, again, it, it's, a, it's, it's a tough road, so if you don't love it, you're going to have a hard time persisting with it. So, I think that would be my best, my best guess and explanation. Labor of love. <laughs> Labor of love, yeah. Well, thank you for your time, sir. Hope you know, you. we'll release you back into the con. And, okay. Uh, <laughs> hope you have a good weekend. Hope you guys do, too. Thanks for the great questions. I appreciate it. From Geekle.com and Cigar Nerds, thank you for the interview. Thank you, guys, too.